Good morning, everybody. It is time for the Fighter Build Bonanza. You see, I wanted a tank because my tank was the fun tank, which was pretty good. That's the tank that uses spell casting to hold aggro. It's pretty fantastic. However, I wanted to go with something that would have a little bit more meat on its bones. And with Fighter getting some buffs and also everybody running Fighter Tank, I thought to myself, why don't I run Fighter Tank too? And so, with the help of an excellent fighter player named Emergencies, uh, I have a new fighter tank build that I can share with all of you. However, the reason why I call this the fighter build bonanza is because you're not just going to get a fighter tank build. You see, to level this character, I actually leveled it as a two-handed fighter. And I gotta say, it was really, really good. You see, the last time I talked about two-handed fighter on this channel was like a couple years ago, where I just didn't really enjoy it that much because I found that while fighter is powerful and it does a bunch of damage, the fact that your health just kind of goes down and you watch it go down and there's nothing you can do about it, that was like really depressing to me and I kind of hated it. Well now fighter is second win, where if you get crowd controlled you can break out of it and you can heal yourself back to full incredibly easily. What this basically means is that it turns the idea that Fighter can't heal itself on its head. And while Fighter used to be one of the worst classes for Hardcore League as a result, it's now so sturdy and reliable, and any situation where you're just like, oh no, I'm suddenly stunned, you can just break your way free, it's fantastic. Second Wind is such an unbelievable ability, it's so hard to describe how much it changes how Fighter is supposed to be. But not only is Fighter better thanks to Second Wind being good, and the Fighter tank has been made better, but for whatever reason, Kensai also got a buff like a couple patches ago. And so two-handed fighter, two-weapon fighter, sword and board fighter, any type of damage fighter using Kensai is now just dramatically stronger than it used to be. Again, for reasons I do not understand. When I ran through the game on my two-handed fighter fighter, you might look at the footage and think to yourself, wow, it's crazy how many pass lives this guy has that helps him out with the smashing. But uh, yeah, my character has no relevant pass lives. It only has favored soul pass lives, which give you mana, which has nothing to do with fighter. This character just absolutely screamed its way through Reaper 2, Reaper 3, just smashing things along the way, and it felt absolutely amazing. Now granted, if you're new to fighter, you might want to start off with like Elite and you work your way up from there, as I have quite a lot of fighter experience having played this game for a while, but it felt absolutely phenomenal. Just ripping your way with a two-hander and smashing your way through the game using the revamped Kensai so everything is much cheaper, you get more bang for your buck, lots of good utility in terms of the crowd control because you get access to stuff like Trip with all the extra tactics DCs that fighters are able to pick up. And then working your way into epics with Dire Charge, ooh, it felt so good. And so the first build I have to share with you is the Two-Handed Fighter Fighter, which you can find in the description. It's pretty straightforward. Lots of strength, and that's about it. Yeah, you need constitution, and you get some decks for some feats and stuff, but again, you just get strength, you put strength on, you hit people, it's pretty straightforward. Now, this build is an Azamar. If you're planning, if you watch this part of the video and you're like, you know what, I, I don't really need to play a tank, I'm not really interested in a tank, and you don't own Azamar, you don't have to play an Azamar. You can play as a human and just put the enhancement points into the racial tree, similar to how I did as the Azamar. As a human, make sure you get all the healing amp, and your character's gonna feel absolutely fantastic, or play whatever race you want, it doesn't really matter. But for the purposes of tanking, I did play as an Azamar for a very specific reason. The way that I worked this character, because I had a lesser heart of wood, is I leveled it as a fighter using the build in the description. And then when I got all the way up to level 32, I then used my lesser heart of wood to fully convert it into the tank version of the build. Leveling as an actual tank is a complete nightmare because my character does zero damage. And if you look through the build, you'll see why. Almost every single available feat that I could turn into toughness is. And I have only defensive feats and abilities. However, the character that is the fighter tank here is no slouch when it comes to actually attacking monsters. And the reason for that is the use of the new raid weapon, Ignition. Now, Ignition is not terribly difficult to get because people run fire over Morgrave all the time, the latest raid added to Dungeons and Dragons Online. And especially on normal, it's not terribly challenging. And if you're playing as a tank character on normal, especially this one, my fighter tank doesn't really need any healing on normal. So if you're following along with this, you'll be able to tank through it and get yourself an ignition in no time. But why is it so good? For two main reasons. First, it has an ability called Identity Crisis. 
And what that does is it makes it so that any monsters that you strike become slowed, basically to a crawl. It's not a stun, it's a slow. And the reason why this matters is lots of monsters in DDO are just immune to all sorts of different types of stuns. Undead are immune to stuns, constructs are immune to stuns. And so because a lot of different monsters happen to be immune to a lot of different crowd control effects, the slow fits in perfectly. It slows monsters so much that it's almost like they're stunned, but they're not. It's not a stun. So it works on basically everything. But not only does it slow which is almost a stun, it also has paralysis on it. So monsters will just get randomly paralyzed. And then finally, it has slay living, which will also just randomly kill monsters you attack. But because this weapon's a bastard sword too, this also allows my character to simply cleave my way through every monster in front of me as a tank and constantly be slowing and stunning monsters. So no, the damage is not amazing, but because of the attack-based utility, I'm actually able to lock down monsters really easily, and it feels like there's an active role. Additionally, because you're attacking all the time, usually a lot of tanks will struggle to hold aggro on constructs or undead or plants, monsters that are generally immune to intimidate. My character has no such problem, because if a monster is immune to intimidate, I'm just doing damage to it and getting damage threat when I attack it. The fighter part gives an unbelievable amount of defense. High armor class, high physical resistance rating, high magical resistance rating, but then also giving me the feats and the utility to be able to get access to the Bastard Sword. Combined with the defenses from the Azimar Tree and the Stalwart Defender, my character gets so much tank, but then also just has that little bit of extra melee utility and it works super duper well. I cannot recommend playing this type of character enough, as it's really, really fun, and there's always more tanks that are needed at the end game, especially if you want to get into Reaper mode. However, this character, as a tank, has no solo capability. You can't do anything by yourself, and it's the main reason why a lot of people don't generally tend to play tanks at the end game when given the option to play like a DPS or another character that might end up being a little bit stronger. As a result, for this character, I would recommend, if you want to start as a tank, make your alt a tank first, maybe. So you have like a tank alt character at cap, so that way you can just swap to your tank when you need to, as opposed to making your main character. Because, well, if you want to farm something or there's a new event, if you don't have friends to play with, it's going to be a very difficult time actually making it through. Now the two-handed fighter build I'm including is a leveling build. You can use it for endgame farming and things like that, but I really wouldn't recommend raiding with it. The main reason is because it uses the stalwart defender tree to be very, very strong. If you are playing as a two-handed fighter, it'll keep you alive. You'll take basically no damage. But the problem is stalwart defender gives a whole bunch of extra threat when you attack monsters. And so during the leveling process, this doesn't matter because you're the fighter. You can have all the monsters attacking you. And even if you're moving to like epic elite quests or legendary elite quests, it's not a big deal because I'm sure the spellcasters in your party would rather the monsters attack the big beefy fighter anyway. But when you move into like R10s or you're moving into an actual raid scenario, pulling aggro off of the tank and turning the boss around so that it kills you and all your friends is not great. So if you did want to take the two-handed fighter fighter and you want to use it as an end game build, there are a couple better ways to do it. But if you're lazy, just remember when you get into an R10 situation or you get into a raid with the two-handed fighter fighter, turn off the defensive stance so that way you don't worry about generating extra threat and causing targets to attack you as opposed to the tank because uh, that will cause problems when the boss turns around and with its frontal cleave kills you and everyone standing next to you. So that's right, you get two builds today, a leveling build and an endgame tank build, and both of which worked super duper well for me. I've actually ran the endgame tank build all the way through Reaper 8 of the new Extreme Challenge Dungeons, and I've ran most quests on R10 at this point, and it just feels very, very satisfying. Now, of course, this character is not using Legendary Greensteel, which means it's easier to get into, but it is not perfect in terms of the gear set, and also... I don't really have any relevant tank pass lives, and uh, tanks can do really well with a lot of pass lives. So you can definitely take this character and move it even further, push that needle all the way, and make it more powerful. But if you want to learn more about the specifics of the tank build, I'm going to pass it over to me with the build. Now, I don't have a build explanation for the two-handed fighter fighter for you, and the main reason is that, like, it's really straightforward. You just put your points into the Kensai tree, and then you put your points in the Stalwart Defender tree, 
and then you hit people with a two-handed weapon. Like, that's basically it. Um, and it's really easy to understand because you just, like, click the mouse. The fighter tank, a little bit more complicated. So we're going to go into the details on this one. So this is Strim Jim, my fighter tank here. Um, Constitution is the main stat, charisma being important, just so I have access to both use magic device and intimidate. Those things are both kind of important. Main stats here, you can kind of see lots of physical and magical resistance rating, as well as armor class. These stats go up in combat because we have some combat effects that increase the defensive stats here. Armor class, this is something I did sacrifice a little bit of armor class for this character, because uh, I find that my playstyle, I wanted a couple other things that weren't in the original build that I I, uh, I was given, and so I did some tweaks and looked over some things, and so uh, this was this is a little bit more customized, but I did give up some armor class. Armor class is uh, not as ideal. As far as the skills go, uh, intimidate and jump and use magic device, as well as at least one point in tumble. Those are your main skills here. Uh, intimidate, this one's obvious. It grabs aggro and monsters. You need to press this, and you're going to be pressing this literally all the time whenever you can. Uh, jump is because uh, you need to be able to jump over stuff and with full plate and tower shield you get a lot of minuses So you just want to get your jump as high as possible. You want to be at minimum 40 uh, Tumble is so that way I can tumble around in combat uh, Tumble is a great way to move while blocking so you don't give up your block If you hold down block and then you press a direction your character will in fact tumble And that tumble is very important because again it allows you just to quickly maneuver um, So it's very good not just like the tumbling that people are doing where they're going fast It's just as a tank good for maneuvering around um, and then use magic device, as I said, being able to heal yourself, restores, resurrections. This is important. You got to have the use magic device as well. As far as the feats go, you're going to notice that the defensive feat uh, toughness is taken a lot. We have seven toughnesses. Every single fighter feat is taken as a defensive feat. Dodge, mobility. Um, I believe I also took spring attack, the heavy armor mastery feats here as well. Combat expertise and spring attack increase that armor class, increase that movement and mobility. And then the seven feats you get from leveling at 1, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18 were all toughness because you want extra hit points. As far as the epics go, uh, this character runs into, again, epic toughness because it's constitution, epic fortitude so you don't fail fortitude saves in a 1, epic DR and bulwark of defense, which gives you extra defenses all the way across the line. And then the epic destiny feats, Grabbing Fount of Life, Perfect Shield Mastery, Elusive Target, and for me personally, I went two-handed specialty because I am using a Bastard Sword. Now, if you don't want to use a Bastard Sword, you would just take uh, the, was it Legendary Toughness or whatever it's called? Legendary Toughness is quite good. I'm just going to angle the camera here. Legendary Toughness is quite good as it gives you 100 hit points, but this instead allows me to take uh, all the shield feats, and then I get access to all the two-handed fighting feats as well as a combination, uh, which just means I get more strike through. So whenever I attack monsters, I'll be applying my slow from my weapon ignition here to multiple targets at the same time. And then I get deific warding from the epic destinies. So looking over the enhancements, we got the Stalwart Defender, we got the Vanguard, we got Falconry, and we have Azamar. Uh, Azamar is really, really good for fighter. As a fighter, you get extra hit points from Tenacious Defense. You get 25% competence bonus. You also get 10% quality from Stand Fast for a 35%. And then you get an extra 5% from Bond of the Protector, giving you 40% increased hit points, which is quite good. So you will want to take all of this. This is all essential. And then, of course, we have Vanguard here as well, which is, again, quite good, being able to pick up the Missile Shield. This is the main thing you want to get here. Uh, deflecting arrows every two seconds is very, very powerful. Archers can give you some hurt, especially if they're dangerous champions like Acherons or Beast Marks. Champions that completely ignore fortifications, so they will crit you back in time. And uh, in the new dungeon that's right here, the new Extreme Challenge dungeon, uh, the archers are doing like 2,000 damage on R10 to my character, even though I'll have like 500 physical resistance rating, which means they're hitting for over 10,000, uh, which sucks. So you want to have deflect arrows because it's really, really nice to keep yourself alive. Now, I have 84 points spent in this build. If you don't have 84 points to spend in the tree, uh, the areas where you want to shave off, I would just take off the three points and reinforce shield. I wouldn't want to do it, but if you only have 80 points and then also just take, uh, or sorry, take one point out of the shield and then take two points out of action boost sprint, and then that will shave you down uh, to 80. So you just got to take two and then two. 
and your character will be down to 80 points and that's the effectively the build here with 11 points in falconry 42 points in stalwart defender and then the 19 in asimar i wouldn't shave any off anything else if you're wondering if you have to play asimar for this tank build yes yes you do um it uses the uh improved recovery here which is great you can also get that out of human but you can't get the divine purpose protector which gives you healing amp it's an extra 32 which is pretty powerful and the positive spell power which is good on top of that you're able to pick up the bond of the protector as well which gives you the extra prr mrr stacking bonus to saving throws and the hit points and then bastard sword proficiency which saves you a feat and you kind of want to save that feat so yes, you want to be an Azamar. This is an Azamar build. If you don't own it, I would recommend buying it before you play this. And especially if you like playing tanks, um, almost all of them are Azamar almost all of the time. It's just too good for tanks. So I definitely, definitely do recommend you pick up Azamar if you want to play as a tank. Now, the exact definition, reason why we take all these different things, Stalwart Defender, you pick up the extra threat here, melee threat. You grab melee threat from Threatening Countenance. You also pick up 100% melee threat here. This character thrives on melee threat as I do attack targets all of the time. Even though you're going to notice I don't really have anything that gives me extra damage, I do get stuff like Defensive Footwork, uh, which gives me extra melee threat as well on top of this. I get Block and Cut, which gives me morale bonus to double strike, so you can do more damage when you're attacking targets for a short duration, which is quite good, and it deals 60% damage on its own. Uh, which again that extra damage will add into the melee threat which is quite good for this build in terms of the epic destinies we're using unyielding sentinel divine crusader and legendary dreadnought now i do have two more points uh than you would have or three more points than you would normally have because i have my epic destiny points in fact i actually think i'm missing an epic destiny point somewhere so i can probably get more oh i don't think i have any fate points yeah i don't have any fate points or anything like that so i can probably get that for myself if you are needing to skim some points somewhere, you have a couple different options. Uh, I would probably go with Divine Crusader here, skim three points out of this, um, you know, drop out on uh, whether any blow, probably drop bulk up, and then maybe drop a point somewhere else, uh, confront any foe, maybe something like that. Stuff you just don't really need as much. I do like all of this, and I wouldn't want to give up on any of it um, because it is all quite good. Out of Unyielding Sentinel, uh, Celestial Mandate here is your epic strike. It deals 60% bonus damage. It has a six second cooldown and it adds hate. This 3000 hate is affected by your melee threat. So my character right now gets a melee threat bonus. If I go under melee combat of 1500 or a percentage. So it's 16 times the melee threat multiplier, which is quite good. Um, so we're getting, you know, a, a lot uh, of the extra threat on our attack that multiplies this amount this is one of the reasons why you don't need that much damage you just have to hit the target additionally this gives you six extra physical and magical resistance rating when you hit somebody and it stacks up to six times for 36 extra physical and magical resistance rating which is super good it also slows enemy movement speed and stacks with our weapon which we'll talk about in a little bit you also grab knight's challenge uh, because this is a forced taunt so it's great for getting guys at range and it's also a stun as well so you can stun basically everything so being able to stun all the monsters that you hit with knight's challenge is very very powerful and something we do here you also pick up some more melee threat from commanding presence which is good too um, although you probably if you're gonna skim anything out of this tree for whatever reason this is probably where i would skim either that or the shield prowess but again we're giving up a lot of armor class already so it, you know there's, I wish I could get more armor class in here. Now, for me personally, I like having Hands of the Sentinel. You don't have to use this. This is definitely my own flavor thing. But I take Hands of the Sentinel, I take Endless Vigil, and I take uh, Light the Dark. Now, the reason why I do this is because Hands of the Sentinel uh, is quite powerful. Um, it allows you to just, um, you know, heal anybody you need to pretty much back to full health instantaneously. Now there is a bug with Hands of the Sentinel where this um, only, it actually only uses level 20. So this does not go to your total character level, unfortunately. It only does level 20. Hopefully that will get fixed in the future. But this combined in making it an area of effect means you can, if a healer takes damage, you can lay on hands them at a distance and it'll heal them and anyone around them. I find that very valuable for doing high Reaper content because uh, it means if a healer takes damage and you're just not close enough to be able to react to it to actually jump in the way, uh, you can heal them and save them from that scenario when they, maybe they use their wings or whatever it is to escape and get out of the way. Now, I also would love to use Into the Fray. I actually think this is extremely powerful because um, uh, it says that you're out of combat for 10 seconds. It's actually like when you're out of combat for like three seconds. This is always active. 
I just don't have the points for it, but it would be nice. If only I had like an extra 10 points, I would just take more stuff on the Elink Sentinel. All of this stuff is really good. You're also going to notice I don't take Renewal. As a fighter, I don't really have any positive spell power. I don't have a way to get positive spell power into my build with my itemization that I put together. So uh, this is going to be a little bit tougher to actually land. Uh, so I decided not to go with Renewal and instead just go with Hands of the Sentinel. But again, you can take out this and this and this and take Renewal. Maybe pick some more armor class and change up things if you want, depending on what it is you're looking for. And then Divine Crusader and Legendary Dreadnought just give you extra stats. Uh, Divine Crusader is fantastic because it gives you... Uh, each core gives you melee power and hit points. You also get uh, weapons that don't break. You get armor class, you get healing amplification, uh, and you get protection from magic missiles, which is really, really nice. And then Dreadnought is great because it gives you a little bit of damage, a little bit of health, and also 15 physical resistance rating, which just reduces the damage you take from everything, as well as extra action boost, which is good for your action boost sprint. Now, itemization, you're going to look at this build here. You'll see a couple things. One of the things you should notice is that I actually don't have a lot of raid gear i only have two pieces which means getting into this is not too bad this is a very basic setup nothing too expensive here the two pieces of raid gear that i am using are in fact the heart of sulamades because this item is um pretty good for a tank there's really no way around that the reason why this item is good is it's an artifact it comes from the raid vision of destruction and it gives you quality constitution which is good resistance which is good Devil's Bones, which gives you fire and evil absorption, and evil and fire damage are some of the most common damage types in raids, so very good on a tank. But most importantly, Devil's Blood, which gives you immunity to curses, poisons, and fears, and curses is the big one. Uh, in raids, there are a lot of curse mechanics that can affect you, and this makes you immune to all of them, which is unbelievably convenient. For example, the number of curses like in Vision of Destruction itself, where the boss curses you so you're immune to healing or in the uh, raid Project Nemesis, where the final boss will curse everyone, and if they don't remove their curse, they die. Uh, you don't have to worry about that because you're immune. This effect is so good on a tank, it's just this level of convenience that you can't really beat. So that's why I recommend Heart of Sulamades. It's not terribly difficult to get, just run Vision of Destruction and you should be in the clear. And then the other piece of raid gear is Ignition, the Fear and Flame. Now this Bastard Sword, it's pretty cool. Uh, I really like it. Uh, this comes from Fire Over Morgrave. Uh, it's got Identity Crisis, which is that slow. It slows monsters basically to a crawl when you hit them. It's got Legendary Paralysis, which will paralyze enemies. Now, you're going to see DC 100 Fortitude save and assume it doesn't work that often. It's not too bad. It works more often than you think, especially because you just attack constantly. And because monsters are slowed by Identity Crisis, they'll just eventually get paralyzed. Uh, you don't expect the paralysis. The big thing is the identity crisis. And then lastly, the Slay Living. This kills monsters way more often than you would think. Um, you just smash people out with this. It's fantastic. Now, you can also upgrade this sword, which is something I'd like to do. But I really like this sword. It fits very well with the build. Uh, you don't have to use this for sure. You can go instead with the Labyrinthine Edge, which is the Kukri that comes out of Project Nemesis. That's generally the weapon that most people use. And uh, if I had more patience, I would use both of them at the same time. But my Sentient Jewel is not even close to being full, so that is pretty far away. Now, as far as the rest of the gear, it actually just occurred to me that I don't even have the whole gear set loaded up here. So we're just going to talk about some of the basics while I load up the other gear set in the background. So uh, the gear set in question is using the new Morgrave set, the uh, armaments of the Archons, because it gives hit points, armor class, PRR, and MRR. It's pretty straightforward. Now, what this gear set is definitely missing is the absorption effect that you get from something like the Sharn tank gear set, the Guardian of the Gates. However, this is pretty much an introductory gear set. It's pretty easy to get this stuff, especially if you own Vecna. Uh, these items are very easy to come by, and the statting is very, very efficient. Um, so we're using the set, the Defender's Cloak, and the Sentry's Helm. So we're using all the tanky defensive items, as well as the spell, or the Bulwark's Plate here, that gives freedom of movement, which is nice because you don't have that anywhere else. Additionally, uh, we're going for the five-piece uh, Forbidden Knowledge set from Vecna. So you're going with the Blade Sworn Bandolier over here. You've got the Mystic Monocle for Charisma and Exceptional Luring skills, which is for your Intimidate. Uh, you have the Lightning Rail Worker's Boots, which gives Insightful Constitution more melee threat and elemental absorption. The Absorption Gauntlet here, which gives even more elemental resistances that stack with everything else, which is very convenient. Also, you want to swap this with the Six Finger Glove when needed, whenever you need Dark Discorporation. So you can swap between those two gloves on command, which is very good. And then uh, that's one, two, three, four. Where's the? Oh, then the five, of course, is the ignition, which is part of the set. 
So you want to make sure you get the ignition here because it's the fifth item of the set. Then just to fill in the slots, uh, I don't need the Ring of Brutal Force. It's the wrong item. I got the Bulwark of Snow Shield. The shield is just fantastic. It's got force absorption and it's a big tanky shield. So force absorption comes in way too handy, way too often. So it's a great item. We have Catra's Wit, which gives insightful alluring skills. That gives you a plus 10 bonus to your Intimidate. Again, on top of the Intimidate you're already getting uh, from other sources. I think I have an Intimidate item somewhere. Uh, and then... We have the actual remainder of the equipment, which is going to be in the actual build here. I just, I guess I didn't finish farming it out. Uh, but the standard issue sigil is nice. It fills up some of the extra item slots here. We have the Kopru Bracers because it gives profane life force. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Circle of Malevolence. The Circle of Malevolence is one of the best tank items you're going to be able to get in the game. It comes from the Raid Mark of Death, which can be very annoying to get, but the stats are gigantic on it. Um, I don't have one, so I'm not using it, uh, and my character is still getting the job done pretty much just fine. I'll go over what I am using. But while I'm still here staring at this, for filigrees, you're going to notice that we're going for all tank here. Uh, we're going for four-piece Nihastoles with the double rares here, as well as the snake bite and grandfather shield so four piece niastoles because it gives 100 hit points we've got the double uh snake bite grandfather shield and some more grandfather shield for the three piece for the extra armor class once you have it and the extra constitution and then we're going for four piece techno mage which gives even more armor class as well and some more constitution on the filigrees now as far as what i'm actually using uh for the interim pieces because i didn't actually farm out all the gear because i was lazy uh, Ring of Brutal Force gives me Profane Life Force, which is fine. I'm using the Necromancer's Bracers for Insightful Physical Sheltering, so I have Insightful Magical and Insightful Physical, so I don't really need to worry too much about having the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Circle of Malevolence here. And then, of course, I have this Necklace, um, which has Insightful Intimidate, which I don't even need. It's got Insightful Charisma and Spell Saves that I crafted. I just found this in my bank, so I just used this instead, and it seemed like it would be okay. Um, I think I have an Intimidate item somewhere. Honestly, I don't even know. Do I have an Intimidate Augment in? Ooh, I might have put an Intimidate Augment into my gear set, now that I think about it. Yeah, I have a Diamond of Intimidate, so I actually don't even have an Intimidate item, which is kind of funny. Probably could have crafted this with Intimidate, but it is what it is. Anyway, that's basically the gist behind the gear set. As far as, like, combat goes, if you actually look at my action bar, you'll notice I don't have a lot of stuff going on on here. Uh, this tank is very, very straightforward. You run into groups, you fight monsters, so you're just charging around finding monsters, you're fighting them, you're actually attacking things. This is not a stand there and block tank. That is not what you do with this build. You want to be actively in there fighting monsters, using your abilities, Celestial Mandate, as well as block and cut on cooldown, because they have very short cooldowns, using stuff like Spring Attack to get around to move to different targets, you're using Intimidate on cooldown or as close to one cooldown to make sure you're holding aggro on stuff, you use Knight's Challenge to stun anything, or if a monster gets away from you to pull it back in, and uh, you have Action Boost Sprint to move around, and then your big cooldowns, you have Last Stand. You press Last Stand, it pretty much doubles your health, as you can see here, gives you extra physical, magical resistance rating, and that's pretty much all you really need to worry about with that one, so your health will go all the way up. You've got your two heals, your Lay on Hands for healing other people, because it does a big AoE, so you go boom, and it heals everybody around. You've also got for yourself Second Wind, which will heal you for more than your entire health bar, because you have a lot of extra healing amplification. And then, of course, last but not least, Undying Vanguard, which is the big cooldown. Are you dying? Press Undying Vanguard, and now you're not. And that's it. It's pretty bare bones when it comes to buttons, too. You don't really have a lot. The action bar is super clear. Compare this to, a, like, a lot of other gamers. It's a very introductory thing. I've done lots of R10 quests with this, and I definitely could stand to gear it out better. So, as I said, uh, from the tank perspective here, um, you know, this is an introductory tank. This is not going to be your be-all, end-all, the last tank you ever play. There are some other build guides out there if you're looking for, like, something that is going to be tanking your R10 raids or, uh, you know, some different specific kind of things. This is just a basic bread and butter fighter tank to get you started. So hopefully if some of you want to get into tanking, this gear set is very lightweight. Um, I really can't recommend you replace anything than the Heart of Soul mod is. It's way too good, especially if you're getting started with tanking and it's not terrible to get. I highly recommend checking out the Vision of Destruction raid. It's not too bad. And then again, Ignition. The sword's really cool. It fits the build really well and I can't recommend it enough. So there's another weapon that is just on that list. And then again, Circle Malevolence. If you get one, that's great. It's got the highest Intimidate in the game. It's got 17 Insightful Sheltering, which is really good. So you can like replace these Bracers. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. So I definitely can recommend it. But again, it's going to be a bit of a wait and see on whether you actually get that one. Because I don't even know if I'm going to get one. So we'll find out. 
But anyways, that's all I have for you today. So thank you so much for watching. We had a fantastic time. Check out this character. As I said, if you want two-handed fighter fighter for leveling and how I leveled this character, down in the description. You want to play as the actual tank? Down in the description. You want to see the VODs from the live stream? Down in the description. And you want to follow the channel, like that video, again, right below the channel. You can do that to get your heart's content. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next time with another build about Rogue. Because I that's I, I already actually finished the character. I just need to stop being lazy and put the video on YouTube. Okay, bye-bye.